Morning everyone. I was going to record this later at home but I've stopped on my bike ride out in the woods and it's calm and peaceful and there's not much wind so I thought I'd give it a go here. Welcome to worship this morning. Um, isn't it great to be able to meet together in this way? Looking forward to uh, to the service as we uh, as we carry on. This week, um, or the last few weeks, I've been using uh, Lectio 365, an app on the phone that I found really helpful for for Bible reflections. Um, I've been riding out each morning, early in the morning, using my allotted exercise slot to do that. Um, the family have been using theirs quite creatively, as you'll see later on in the service. But uh, one of the days where it's been talking, it's been focusing on on God's healing and some of the promises uh, about God's healing for the nations. Uh, and on one of the days, it, it focused quite a bit on uh, one of the Psalms that I thought I'd read now. Uh, and then we'll pray, and then the service will continue. Good to see you. Psalm 103, this is eight to 12. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love, he will not always accuse, nor will he harbour his anger for ever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, or repairs according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Lord God, thank you that you are gracious and compassionate. Be with us in this time of worship this morning. Let your spirit flow through the words that people bring. Let us draw near to you and know your presence and your love and your healing power. Thank you that we can put our trust in you. Let's join together in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for the kingdom, the power, the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Hello, the reading today is from Luke chapter 24 verses 13 to 35 on the road to Emmaus. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them but they were kept from recognising him. He asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have, that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. Who is a prophet? Powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us, that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it is just as the woman had said. But they did not see Jesus. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going farther. But they urged him strongly, 
stay with us, for it is nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognised him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us whilst he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way, and now Jesus was recognised by them and when he broke the bread. Come for a walk with us in Berniston. Can you tell where we've been? Somewhere near here is good for conkers. Do you know where we are? Somewhere near here is red and salty. Do you know where we are? So, these are the letters we got. We got an O, an L, an E, and a V. So, let's try spelling them in the right order. There, it says Vol. But I don't think that's the correct answer, so let's try again. That looks 
looks more like it because it says love. We've been on a walk around Burniston collecting clues. When we only had some of the clues, it was hard to understand what the message might be. But once we had all of them, the message was clear. When Jesus died on, his, on the cross, his disciples uh, found it hard to understand. They only had some of the clues. But on the walk to Emmaus, Jesus helped to explain it all to his friends. And they were left in no doubt that Jesus loved them and that he'd come not just to save the Jewish people from the Romans, but all humankind. Wonderfully, we can ask the Holy Spirit to live in us, and he walks with us all the time, just like Jesus walked with his friends long ago. He can help us to understand the Bible and to live like him. And why did he do all of this? Well, he did it because he loves us. He loves you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you love us and you walk with us on our journey of life. We thank you that we don't have to lean on our own understanding, but that you will direct our paths. And we especially pray that you will be with us in these uncertain times. Amen. God of love and new life, in this season of Eastertide, when the joy of the resurrection is tempered with the sadness of isolation and separation. Lead us into hope through the unity which is of your very essence. If we feel lonely, let us know that in Christ we are never alone. If we feel isolated, remind us that within the worldwide body of Christ we are always connected. If we feel useless, inspire us to the simple actions that make a difference to others. If we feel overwhelmed, offer us shade and calm in moments of graceful and prayerful stillness. If we need a hug, help us to feel the warmth of your embrace. And when we are compelled to keep our distance, may we be drawn close to each other within the spirit of companionship that flows from you and which moves through and between each one of us. Amen. Hello everybody, it's David here with some thoughts on the story of the Emmaus Road. When the familiar and everyday becomes strange and unusual, we can quickly become disorientated and apprehensive. In such moments we realise how much we rely on patterns and routines to reassure us and enable us to remain solid grounded. When these are disrupted by bereavement, illness, losing one's job or simply moving to a new area, the challenge to keep it all together can sometimes feel overwhelming. To ponder this, especially now as we're all adjusting to an extended period of lockdown and social distancing, with all the challenges to our well-being that this COVID-19 pandemic crisis brings with it, is to find ourselves walking in the footsteps of the two disciples who were trudging the seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus. On that first Easter evening, what was such a familiar journey with every turn in the road, every tree, rock formation and view being known and recognised, has suddenly become a strange pathway of despondency and loss. They walk the familiar road beset with very unfamiliar and profoundly disturbing thoughts and feelings. And over all of this hangs a heavy pall of despair shrouding them from joy, hope and energy like an all-enveloping fog, plunging them into an impenetrable state of gloom and lostness. Their Easter predicament has overwhelmed them with all the terrifying power of a sudden and fierce thunderstorm on a summer's day. 
The cruel death of Jesus has caught them dangerously exposed, way out in the open of their vulnerability. They are unprotected and unprepared for the ferocity of such a fast approaching storm. Now anyone who has ever had depression or lost someone close to them knows precisely what I mean and what this feels like. And in these lockdown times, we're all having to adjust as best we can to that which is unfamiliar and unwelcome as we try to keep one another safe. As the catastrophe of Jesus' death engulfs this pair of disciples, their focus narrows from the trivia of everyday, humdrum life to the things and especially to the people and relationships that really matter. They turn the events of the last three days over and over and over again in their minds, endlessly replaying them as though next time the outcome could be different. But it never is. Taking our usual route to walk our dogs over Easter, was a surreal experience which brought all of this home to me. Normally on a beautifully sunny day during the Easter holidays, Filey would be full of holiday makers and tourists. The beach would be absolutely packed. The roads in and out of town would be busy. Car parks crammed to capacity. Caravan parks full with visitors the parks and open spaces, the promenade full of activity, the paddling area crammed, but not now. Let's walk together and notice how strange it all is. The roads are devoid of traffic. Not a car packed with kids and luggage touring caravan or motorhome is in sight. A playground normally full of the energetic noise of children is silent and still. In the caravan parks there is not a parked car in sight on the pitches signifying that no one is staying here. The static parks are empty and unnaturally quiet. Walking on a little further, the road to the main car park has no traffic passing by at all. A park normally bustling with families enjoying themselves has only a couple out for their permitted exercise with their dog. Looking at all this, it's as though one has entered a dystopian nightmare. And then in the playground area, the reason is plain to see. This is why the paddling pool isn't thronged with toddlers and their families. This is why the promenade is largely deserted. And you have to look closely into the far distance to see anyone on the beach on this beautifully sunny and perfectly cloudless spring day. The walk to Emmaus was just like this in its isolating strangeness. And then, as now, Jesus walks alongside these two in their time of struggle. He draws close he prompts them to open up and share what is troubling them. 
and out it pours in a deluge of anguish. Cleopas and his companion, possibly his wife, speak of broken dreams and hopes cruelly dashed against the might of imperial Rome and the intransigence of their own religious leaders. They tell of God's promised liberation and of their trust in the man Jesus of Nazareth. And in our lockdown, he does precisely the same for us, especially as we companion one another. And walking with them, Jesus takes it, all of it, every last pain, hurt, frustration, anger, rage and tear. He takes it all and he holds it and he carries it with them. Just as on the cross, Jesus takes and makes their struggle his own passion. And in our lockdown, he does precisely the same for us, especially as we companion one another. With these two disciples, he holds their confusion and bewilderment at what their compatriots had told them that very morning about Jesus' body not being in the tomb. Having heard that Jesus was alive, they had been let down again. Their friends hadn't seen Jesus. They hadn't seen Jesus. Jesus takes their numbing emptiness and begins to transform it. Walking alongside them, he proceeds to engender within their shattered minds the beginnings of hope, the genesis of possibility. Working his way through scripture, he reframes to them God's promises, reshapes their expectations of what God is doing through the crucifixion of Jesus. He gets them to the point at which they begin to see that it is not the end at all. They're not walking away from broken promises, but with each step they are drawing closer to their very fulfilment. In our lockdown, he does precisely the same for us, especially as we companion one another. When Cleopas and his companion draw close to their home, Jesus makes as though to continue on his journey. They have to ask him to come inside and be their guest. Kerry Richards' painting, The Supper at Emmaus, in the Methodist Collection of Modern Art, is a design study for an altarpiece in the College Chapel of St Edmund Hall, Oxford. It captures the critical moment of this encounter. For this is the pivotal moment of disclosure and awareness for the two disciples. It is for us too. It is always like this. We have to ask him to step inside our lives. We have to want him to join us. And we have to know why. Why is he so precious that nothing matters more than he becomes our companion? Jesus has brought these two to just that point of understanding, to just that decisive moment. And they take it and make it their own. Here in the painting, as he breaks bread, their eyes are opened and they truly see. In a heartwarming moment of pure insight and radiant perception, they are now ready to see the risen Christ and know the truth. And only now does Christ permit himself to be seen. The disciple in blue is pushing back in his chair and starting to stand up. Christ, framed by a yellow cross, representing the beating theological heart of Easter, is in the process of becoming diffuse, his body translucent in the act of blessing and disclosure. The disciple in green has yet to get there, but tantalisingly is right at the tipping point moment. This is the instant that the ancient promises are fulfilled. 
In this moment he is their true companion. Indeed, a companion is our companis, the one with whom we break bread. And the companionship of Jesus Christ cannot be taken away from us ever. As the risen embodiment of God's promises to us, he is our companion for all eternity. And Kerry Richards captures that truth in this painting. All disciples of Jesus, then and now, reach this point of decision on the journey of faith. And all disciples of Jesus, then and now, can choose to welcome the risen Christ as their companion and saviour. Why else do Cleopas and his partner leg it all the way back to Jerusalem in such a hurry to share their testimonies? It's because this is now their truth, just as it is ours. And before they can get the words out, their companions are bursting out with their Easter testimonies too. What was true in the lockdown of hopelessness and despair on that first Easter day is true now. And God wants us to see it for ourselves. Towards the end of our dog walk, as we near home, we pass a line of blocking panels erected by the developers on the estate. Except that one of them is now damaged leaving a ragged hole through which we can see what lies beyond. The journey to Emmaus takes us to just such a place of disclosure and revelation, as God invites us to see beyond the barriers of lockdown to the far horizon of love and hope. It's closer than we think. All we have to do is step through and experience it for ourselves. God bless you all, and may Jesus bring you light, love and hope on your journey through lockdown. We now come to the special time in our worship, our prayer time, when we can be with God to worship him, to give thanks for his grace and goodness, to ask for forgiveness and to bring our concerns and our cares and lay them at the foot of the cross in the care of Jesus, our intercessor and our high priest. Sal and I started our preparation by praying through the passage we've been studying with David this morning, the familiar story of those travellers on the Emmaus Road. We realised that their hopes had indeed been dashed by the shocking events of the crucifixion and the fear of, and confusion of the next few days. But then it is a direct encounter with the living Jesus which makes their hearts burn within them and rekindles their faith and their hope. We'd like to read a short meditation by Frank Topping to set the scene for our prayer time. It's called To the End of the World. Lo, I am with you always, to the close of the age. How bleak that sad, dead day the tomb was sealed with stone. How deep the groans of grief for those who talked and laughed and ate and shared the dusty road. Had seen the eyes, had touched the hands and heard the voice that promised life. And then, mourners on the road to Emmaus, they broke bread and saw his face at a breakfast meal on a fisherman's beach. His broken hands gave bread. And those who witnessed knew that the Lord of love, crucified and buried, was indeed the Lord of life. Risen Lord, who every day triumphs over death. You are with us now. Let me live my life aware of your presence. Open my eyes that I might see your thorn-crowned head among the poor, 
the hungry, the sick, the mourning, the suffering and oppressed. Make my heart your home, that from the deadness of sin I might be raised to a life of love. Amen. So let's take up whatever comfortable position or stance we find helpful to bring our prayers humbly before our Lord and our God through the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord God, we thank you for those times in our lives when we have felt our hearts burning within us, either on our own mountaintop experiences or close encounters with you, or in special blessed times with our church family. We pray for strength and hope when we feel lost and cut off. Give us an unending trust and assurance in your loving kindness, even in the darkest of days, we pray. Jesus said, Lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. Heavenly Father, in the midst of a world turned upside down in so many ways, we must not forget to praise you for your glorious creation of the natural world, the constancy and the beauty of the changing seasons as winter gives way to a glorious spring and new life emerges in such generous abundance. The majesty of the sun and stars, the mighty mountains and the oceans and the intricacies of the wings of the first butterfly of the year and the fragility and perfection of a tiny wren's nest. You are a generous God and we thank you and we praise you for your grace and goodness to us. And God saw all that he had made and it was very good. As we share worship together in a new virtual way as an inclusive church family at Burniston Methodist Church, we thank you, Lord, for the gifts and skills you have given us to help make this happen. Thank you that it is now easier for us to ask friends and neighbours to come to church with us from their own homes by giving them details of the service times and links on YouTube and by inviting them personally. We bring before you elderly or disabled friends who may find this way of worship difficult or inaccessible. Help us to be sensitive, to find ways to include them fully. And we pray for the strengthening and enriching and deepening of our fellowship at Burniston at this time, as we also join with millions of Christians around the world. Thank you for the global witness we have become part of, an army of prayer asking for God's healing and his blessings. For well, Jesus did say, Go and make disciples of all nations. Lord, we bring before you a world in turmoil, struggling to cope with this pandemic, such harmful, indiscriminate virus. We pray for our leaders in the government and in the opposition in this country, and indeed leaders throughout the world. And we pray for those in the realms of science and medicine, great minds endeavouring to defeat the destruction and the anguish. Give them wisdom, skill, courage and compassion as they strive to find vaccines and treatments to disable coronavirus-19 and to bring relief to our hurting world. May a spirit of cooperation and support between nations bring about a new order as we realise we are all equal in your eyes and we all, all your precious children. But Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons and daughters of God. We bring before you, Lord, the millions throughout the world and in our own country who are caring for those affected by COVID-19. For carers looking after the most vulnerable, 
whether in their own homes or in care and nursing homes. We acknowledge their dedication and skill, but also their anxieties about how they can keep those in their care safe and about their own and their families' health and well-being. For nurses, doctors and all those working in hospitals, using their skills and compassion to look after the sick. We pray for those working to bring the necessary equipment and supplies that enable them all to work safely and effectively. And we see, Lord, how the challenge of this terrible disease has turned so much of our lives and thoughts upside down. We see how much we owe as a nation to people who have come from all over the world to work in our care and health services. People who have been anxious about their continued right to live and work in the UK. People who are paid well below the threshold that would make them welcome to come and work here. We see how important are those who harvest our crops, who drive our buses, who deliver food and other supplies to our homes. So we pray that when this crisis is past, the respect and gratitude now being shown to our key workers will become part of a new reality, a new compassionate approach to public policy based on the values of love, respect and justice. For Jesus said, many who are first will be last and many who are last will be first. Now we pray directly for those who are sick with this virus, those in anxious isolation at home, those in, in care homes, those in hospital and intensive care units. And we see on our screens day by day the unspeakable pain and suffering of individuals. In the silence now, we bring before you those we know personally who are affected and we remember the countless millions that we don't know. We pray also for others who are ill with other problems and perhaps too frightened to go to hospital or concerned about the continuation of their treatments. We think of them now in the silence. Bring healing and comfort, Lord. Paul wrote about God as the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble. We pray now for those who have lost someone dear to them, those suffering the agony of bereavement, the pain of disruption of not being together in difficulties and of not being able to say goodbye or give a proper acknowledgement in memory of a precious life lost so suddenly. We think of those we know and those we may have witnessed in the media and we remember them now in the silence. You knew what it was like, dear Lord, to experience these most human of emotions and you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, the Comforter, can bring relief. Give us the healing words to bring to these conversations and by your power use us in a mighty way to comfort others. For John tells us that Jesus wept when he saw the distress caused by the death of his friend Lazarus. We also want to pray for anyone who's finding the current situation with its heightened anxiety, isolation, fear and depression, finding it difficult to contain. You, Lord, wrestled with loneliness and temptation when you walked among us and you understand the torments with which our minds can struggle. 
In the silence now, we remember those with known mental illnesses and also those who are just finding themselves disturbed by new pressures that lockdown living and social isolation bring. In the silence, we think of those who may be on the edge mentally or living in fear within their home situation. We pray for healing and comfort for the mind and for mental well-being. Use us, Lord, to be alongside those we know who may suffer in this way and bring them peace of knowing Jesus, their loving Saviour, we pray. For Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And we close with familiar words from Scripture that remind us and reassure us of the constant presence of our God. The psalmist wrote, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. And St Paul wrote to the young church in Rome, I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen.